All right, I'm back for part two of the Kubrick, Ovid, Minotaur, Theseus, and Ariadne uh, presentation. I ended the first one prematurely, but perhaps it'll be better that way because who knows how long it'll take me to get through all this. So if we have to break it down into three parts, we have to break it down into three parts. <clears throat> um, so I ended the last presentation with a, a reading of book eight lines 152 through 182 from A.S. Klein's version. And so if you haven't seen part one, you should go do that. And now I want to do a line by line examination and see what happens. I have, I have then a, uh, a chart that I made. It's not scientific or anything like that, where I outline each character. Um, I dig a little bit into their mythological background. I entertain at different tiers of meaning um, who the people in the narrative could be and how they relate to The Shining. And then I'm looking for peppered references to these people from the Minotaur myth primarily in The Shining, but really throughout the entire filmography. And this was a lot harder than I expected. I learned a lot about mythology in the process. And I think there's much more to the Minotaur thesis and Ariadne story than is commonly believed. Like everybody goes, oh, you know, Jack's the Minotaur and, and Danny's Theseus and he's got to get out of the maze. I, there's more to it. There's a lot more to it. And we're going to go over those details. All right, so when Minos reached Cretan soil, he paid his dues to Jove. With the sacrifice of a hundred bulls and hung up his war trophies to adorn the palace. All right, I'm gonna go into Minos and Crete and Jove later on, but I just wanted to note here with the sacrifice of a hundred bulls. There are so many bulls in Kubrick. And so I've talked about these creation of these categories. I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know what the creation of these categories is gonna lead to, but I can see it, you know, I can see when things repeat. So with the sacrifice of a hundred bulls. So here are some examples of bulls in Kubrick. Slim Pickens rides the bull bomb and strange love, right? He rides it down like he's a. He was a. I think he was in real life a, a rodeo, uh, a, a a rodeo professional, and he he rides it down like a bull, right? Um, Danny attempts to hit the bullseye in the games room. This is when Jack says, him, "Oh, you are you get tired of bombing the universe, right?" That's a that's a reference to uh, a special operation. Um, Wooly Bully plays when Joker meets Animal Mother in Full Metal Jacket. These are, these are just the first three that I could think of. There's many more bulls in Kubrick. Okay. The scandal concerning his family grew, and the queen's unnatural adultery was evident from the birth of a strange hybrid monster. All right, what I say about this um, strain, this queen's unnatural, strange um, adultery. Well, she has a strange hybrid monster. And I found that kind of interesting that um, we have a movie called Strange Love, right? All right. What is it? What does this name "Strange Love" even mean? Even more intriguing, "Strange Love" produces uh, this bull bomb, right? So, "Strange Love" in a sense is uh, producing the cinematic uh, metaphor here. So, I thought that was interesting. Minos resolved to remove this shame, the Minotaur from his house and hide it away in a labyrinth with blind passageways. 
Daedalus celebrated for his skill in architecture, laid out the design and confused the clues to direction and led the eye into a torturous maze by the windings of alternating paths. I don't, I don't know if you guys can hear the helicopters overhead right now. Hopefully you can still hear me. Daedalus celebrated for his skill in architecture, laid out the design, and confused the clues to direction. And I think this is a big deal. So it looks like we may have two sets of clues. I postulate that Kubrick, as architect, as Daedalus, his clues might be misleading. And then we have Ariadne's clues. And, and these might be the ones that really help us get out of the labyrinth. So there may be false clues and true clues. And an amalgamation of true and false clues raising the question, how do we know when we examine these clues that we aren't getting more deeply entrapped in the labyrinth or when we are getting out? Do all these clues that we are picking up on serve only to make Kubrick's work this, Kubrick's work this maze that we cannot get out of and we will die in or are we looking at clues that will get us out of the labyrinth into, into which we feel we have been born? I stumbled over my words there a little bit, but I think you understand what I'm saying. So, and led the eye into a torturous maze by the windings of alternating paths. So I was, I was watching Room 237. I had resisted watching Room 237 for so long because, uh, you know, I thought I kind of knew what it was about and it kind of had gotten a bad rap. I thought it was a pretty intriguing movie. A good start on this stuff. But what I noticed is that different people are picking up on different clue sets, right? There's so many different people in that movie and they have a different understanding of what's going on in Kubrick. And, uh, yeah, we've contemplated how maybe all these interpretations are true and could perhaps be integrated when we step back and view the meta narrative. But I think if we take this allegory seriously, we might want to contemplate if the messages we think we are deciphering, such as the ones about American genocide, the Holocaust, and, and even the ones that I'm sympathetic to, are meant to lead us astray from the real passage out of the maze. My intentions are good here, but I think it wouldn't be responsible to not consider this option. All right. No differently from the way in which the watery meander deludes the sight flowing backwards and forwards in its changeable course through the meadows of Phrygia, facing the running waves and advancing to meet it, now directing its uncertain waters towards its source, now towards the open sea. So Daedalus made the endless pathways of the maze and was scarcely able to recover the entrance himself. The building was as deceptive as that. All right, these winding, uh, th this meander flowing backwards and forwards. All right, here we have a clue to things going backwards and forwards in the maze. We have the most obvious example of this with red rum murder, right? But this seems to fit very well with what Kubrick is trying to accomplish. I don't necessarily endorse this view, but there is a Kubrick shining critic named Ice Cream who overlaps the shining and watches it backwards and forwards at the same time. And maybe this approach is given credence by a close reading of Ovid. So the fact that the the that it the the, the maze is going backwards and forwards, we have some sort of uh, uh, precedent for all the backwards writing and um, reverse clues that are in The Shining. I, 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 the thing I got from reading this part of Ovid so closely is like Kubrick is really dialed into this. It's, he's not just kind of like, oh yeah, there's a minotaur. He's like really connecting The Shining to it. All right, so there's this part. So Daedalus made the endless pathways of the maze and was scarcely able to recover the entrance himself. Whew, I find this very interesting. If Kubrick is the Daedalus figure who is designing this puzzle language maze of his filmography, whatever that may mean, 
he almost deceives himself so that he cannot exit a labyrinth of his own construction. It's hard for me to say exactly what that means at this juncture, but it's important to think on. How did Daedalus get out of the maze? I think for us to really answer this, we have to have a firm conclusion as to the boundaries of the maze. Is the maze just the construction of the shining? Or is the maze part of the larger reality? Is the larger reality a variety of consciousness? Depending on the level of inquiry, how Daedalus Kubrick got out of the maze is going to vary. Mm. All right, here's the second paragraph, the start of it. In there, Minos walled up the twin form of bull and man and twice nourished it on Athenian blood. But the third repetition of the nine-year tribute by Lot caused the monster's downfall. All right, so Minos walled up the twin form. So the exit is walled up. How do you get in and out without clues? From above, I find it interesting that the shining starts with an intelligence soaring above the gold beetle. Perhaps we are entering and exiting the maze from above. In Ovid's rendition, Daedalus and Icarus are later imprisoned in the Tower of Crete, and they use their wings of wax and feathers to escape. However, there is a belief by some that they were imprisoned in the maze and flew out. I'm not sure where the discrepancy comes from, but just throwing that out there as a potential explanation for the scene at the beginning of the movie. Also interesting how we get a reference to the twin form of the bull and man. Throughout this seminar, we've encountered all kinds of twins and doublings, and here we have another, <clears throat> but used in a different sense. So the first sense is one of two children or animals born at the same birth but also something containing or consisting of two matching or corresponding parts. And that's what we have with the Minotaur. It's a bull and a man making a composite being. All right, what about this? But the third repetition of the nine year tribute by Lot. The repetition of the tribute is probably an important thing to meditate on. If the shining involves a repetition as the final photograph intimates, then it is possible there have been, been Theseus-like figures who have tried to exit the maze before. This is a theme worth considering given the hotel's history. Or if there were, were not Theseus figures such as Danny, who was the tribute? Who did the Minotaur feast on in the past? All right. When through the help of the virgin princess Ariadne, by rewinding the thread, Theseus, son of Aegeus, won his way back to the elusive threshold that no one had previously regained, he immediately set sail for Dia, stealing the daughter of Minos away with him, then cruelly abandoned his companion on that shore. All right. Um, I was going to, I think the first real thing I have to say here is, is the rewinding of the thread, right? This is pretty clearly matching with Danny, uh, rewinding his steps, retracing his steps. Um, what was the other thing that I thought was interesting here? He stole the daughter of Minos away with him. We see in the ending of The Shining that uh, uh, Danny and Wendy escape with the snow cat. So we have a matching there. And I, I think this is, for this and for other reasons, we, I think we can pretty confidently claim that if Danny is Theseus, um, Wendy is going to be Ariadne, although I don't know how that works if she's a virgin princess and gave birth to Danny. So it's a fine line I'm walking here about who's who uh, and taking this uh, more literally than other people. Deserted and weeping bitterly as she was, Bacchus Lieber brought her help 
and comfort so that she might shine <clears throat> among the eternal stars. He took the crown from her forehead and set it in the sky. It soared through the rarefied air, and as it soared, its jewels changed to bright fires and took their place, retaining the appearance of a crown as the Corona Borealis between the kneeling Hercules and the head of the serpent that Ophicus holds. All right. So I, you know, I asked here so that she might shine among the eternal stars. And, you know, is this another possible source for the title, the shining? I mean, we know he got it from uh, King, but, you know, could have leaned into that. Uh, the bright fires. Um, I had this to say, could Ariadne's crown, the Corona Borealis, be alluded to in the Al Boli rendition of Midnight with the Stars and You? Midnight with the Stars and You. Um, I just had that to say. What about this Corona Borealis? Yeah. The Corona Borealis, I'm going to say more about this, but the Corona Borealis is made up of seven stars, this constellation. And I'm going to have more to say about that shortly because this is not going to be the only time <clears throat> that we're going to see the repetition of the number seven in Kubrick, but really seven stars. But we'll get to that in a moment. So now I want to go through and talk about the individual characters. All right, so Minos, King Minos, he's the king of Crete. And what I found in doing this, <laughs> there's all these kings in Kubrick's work. Um, just, you know, you start, and maybe, and maybe you could say, oh, Luke, you know, you take anything and you start noticing these patterns, you'll, you'll find that they keep coming up. You could do this for anything. Maybe you could, and maybe that's revelatory. I don't know. As a king, king of Crete. So just an example, some of the kings, um, King Minos, Jupiter. We talked about Jove. Jupiter is the king planet. I just mentioned Stephen King, um, Scatman and Jack Nicholson. I think they are in like four movies together, one of them being the king of Marvin Gardens. Um, Theseus is also a king of Athens. This is just a small smattering of how often king comes up in Kubrick. So king of Crete, son of Jupiter and Europa. So I think that's going to be super important. And in, in the story, uh, <clears throat> just in talking about here, there we've got four sons of Jupiter just in the story. We have Minos, Apollo, Bacchus Lieber, Hercules. These are all sons of Jupiter. Uh, the wife of Minos is, uh, my gosh, I, how do I say her name? Um, she mates with the Snow White, um, the Snow White uh, bull. Let me see, I'll do my pronunciation here. Pacifi. 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 It feels wrong, <laughs> but that's what it is, Pacifi. Um, wife Pacifi has love affair with the bull from the sea, gives birth, and the Minotaur actually has a name that will likely be very important, Asterion. And we mentioned that he sacrifices to Jove, King Minos does, and imprisons the Minotaur in the labyrinth made by Daedalus. And he keeps Daedalus prisoner, but Daedalus has a plan. Makes, King Minos makes war in King Coculus of Sicily, where Daedalus has escaped to. So, yeah. So, I talked earlier in the, in the first installment of this, there being like levels of interpretation. And I tried to do that, you know, looking at things, just keeping things on the screen, trying to analyze like that being like, I should call this like le first level, like on the screen level of interpretation. And then level two is like a larger commentary about reality. But King Minos is, uh, so I'm thinking, is Stephen King, King Minos? 
And Kubrick is the architect, AKA Daedalus, that makes the labyrinth. I, I, I feel like that's, that feels pretty good that Kubrick was leaning into that. And then on a deeper level, Kubrick is Daedalus and the labyrinth is not just the film, but a larger orchestration of reality, which would require that Kubrick has made the maze on behalf of a sovereign or a representative of the king. Who could this king be? Could it be a representative such as Kennedy, as alluded to with the persona of Allman? Just noting here that there are a variety of eagles throughout the film. Jack wears an eagle shirt, the Adler typewriter, the eagle in Almond's office. The eagle is the representative bird of Jupiter, and King Minos is the son of Jupiter. I'm not going to go too deep into this here, but for some reason, Kubrick, Kubrick is giving us a ton of birds in this movie. Danny watches the Roadrunner, the loon calls in The Shining, and there seems to be some intentional signaling with these birds. All right, Crete. Crete is an island in the Mediterranean Sea that worshiped the bull in Minoan times. Hercules lets loose a white bull of Crete on the plains of Marathon and Theseus overcomes it. Um, it's the kingdom of Minos, the seventh labor of Hercules. He kills a bull that was ravaging it. Crete was sacred to Diana. All right, that's gonna be important. So, Level one, and I think one of these books is going to be, or a couple of these two books are going to be really important. I'm going to get to them in a second. But apparently there was this guy named Sir Arthur Evans. I have not read, I, these just came in the mail. I've not had a chance to read these. But this Minotaur myth is so much bigger than I think any of us understand. This guy named Sir Arthur Evans is responsible for like our modern understanding of uh, Minoan culture and the Minotaur. And I believe this is gonna be relevant here. The House of the Double Axe by Agnes Carvon. I'm gonna read a passage from this in not too long, right? <laughs> the House of the Double Axe, you see where this is going? So level one, if we're going to keep this allegory going, this would make the Overlook Hotel the island of Crete which very interestingly was sacred to the moon goddess Diana. To be even more specific, the palace of Knossos and the overlook share some architectural motifs to my eyes. The palace of Knossos was the specific place where the Minotaur was imprisoned. I have to say that some of these insights were brought to my attention by Gaurav Jain over on Twitter, and he has a Kubrick book out called The Mirroring, in which he claims to have solved The Shining. So I have not read it, but uh, I admire uh, his confidence. He might have. According to Wiki, the Palace of Knossos was also built by Daedalus, built with the double-headed ax and it looks like the axe was associated with the Minoan civilization. Speculation has ranged from a volcano destroying the palace to the Mycenaeans. The Timberline Lodge that the exterior of the Overlook is based upon is on Mount Hood, a dormant volcano. So, um... That's awesome. Uh, let's look at this. I think this is where I'm going to talk about Sir Arthur Evans and the double axe. So Sir, Ar I, I just mentioned him. Sir Arthur John Evans was a British archeologist and pioneer in the study of Aegean civilization in the, in the Bronze Age. He's most famous for unearthing the palace of Knossos on the Greek island of Crete Based on the structures and artifacts found there and throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, Evans found that he needed to distinguish the Minoan civilization from the Mycenaean Greece. Evans was also the first to define Cretan scripts, Linear A and Linear B. 
as well as an earlier pictographic writing. Okay, <laughs> so this guy, not only does he find the, these unusual languages, but a pictographic writing. What are we talking about here? We're talking about a type of cinematic hieroglyphics, right? That seems to adorn this labyrinth that Kubrick has made. <laughs> so the parallels are really deep here. Uh, this is from um, Wikipedia. And also I noticed, again, the name Arthur keeps coming up in Kubrick stuff, like Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle with the Sherlock Holmes presentation. Um, King Arthur is going to be relevant to all of this. I have not gotten into King Arthur. Um, I mean, you can think about that King Arthur, Camelot, who's associated with Camelot, you know? And now Arthur Evans. Here is a, here is a, 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 a passage from the House of the Double Axe. I was able to get this off uh, Google Books. And I, I look, as soon as I have time to read these, I'm going to get all into it. But, you know, in, in Stephen King's The Shining, he uses a croquet mallet. And Kubrick replaces it with a, an axe and a very special kind of axe, which I'm going to talk about later. But it's a double-headed axe if you look into it. Although some evidence indicates that a cult of the double axe existed in Egypt at a very early date, none indicates that the cult came from Egypt to Crete. Its origin is to be sought elsewhere, and Lydia seems to have the best claim. Accordingly, to, according to a widely accepted theory, the key to the mystery lies in the interpretation of the Lydian word labyrinth. This theory holds that labyrinth means double axe and that labyrinthros was actually the place of the sacred axe. The tradition made it the place of the minotaur, protected, protected by the horns of the bull, by the double axes, and by the other sacred emblems, the labyrinthos, or palace of the priest king, especially the West Wing with its many pillared shrines and underground crypts became a fortress against which men hoped the powers of evil might not prevail. The location of the find, the irregularity of the wall, the intricate passages, and the scratched signs led Stillman to conclude that the merchant had stumbled upon the labyrinth of legend where the Minotaur had been imprisoned. The signs Stillman thought might be attempts at early writing Hieroglyphs, perhaps, or perhaps they might even be clues by which the keeper of the Minotaur had made his way in and out of the labyrinth. How crazy is this that there is a secret language, a secret language embedded in the Minotaur myth, and we have a secret language embedded in what seems to be the predominating metaphor of all of Kubrick's work. <laughs> Like, how does this happen? Mm. I guess this is geniuses doing genius things. So, um, given previous uh, commentary, um, on a deeper level, I think we might have to ask ourselves, is, is Kubrick trying to analogize Crete with America? Okay. I mentioned Diana. And this is very early. I'm not going to go into this, but, you know, there's a witchy woman in room 237. And I, I pondered whether somehow she might be connected to Diana. And the thing is about Diana, she she's like a triplicated goddess. She also can take the form of Artemis. Uh, how do you say this? Hecate, Hecate, Luna. Um, so I think we might want to think about how Kubrick is playing with that deeper aspect of this myth. Okay. Half hour in. Jeez Louise. All right. Jove, aka Jupiter or Saturnius. Jove, Jupiter, sky god, son of Saturn and Rhea. And I want to say here, like there's this you start again, you start building these categories. We've got a father and a son. We've got other fathers and sons in this whole thing, right? We have Jack and Danny, Saturn and Jupiter. We talked about JFK and JFK Jr., Daedalus and Icarus, Jupiter and Minos. It goes on and on and on. 
The oak is his sacred tree. His emblems of power are the scepter and lightning bolt. His wife and sister is Juno. The eagle is his representative bird. Minos is his son by Europa, father of Hercules via Alcamina, married his sister Juno, aged Trojans by attacking Greek ships. Ajax and Ulysses are both great grandsons of Jupiter through the male line, Ajax through Telamon and Iacus, Ulysses through Laertes and Arcisius. He plagues Aeneas' people on Crete until they are forced to leave. Now, I should mention here that I am kind of doing what I thought were highlights from the hypertext, the UVA hypertext of um, Klein's translation of, of Ovid's Metamorphosis. I highly recommend checking this out. Um, just for the ability to navigate through all the different characters. These are not exhaustive descriptions of all the characters. I And some details that I've left out will, may prove to be very informative later on. So, on this first level, according to Wiki, and much more, and much more work has to be done about this, but when Ops, Jupiter's mother, realized Saturn would devour her child, she moved them to Crete. Therefore, there is a strong connection between the king god and the island. Very sketchy on the details, but I think one ought to look into the cult of Jupiter and the connection to the Roman Empire. If this allegory holds up, it might be possible to establish Jupiter worship with Crete, the Gnosis Palace, and perhaps the Overlook Hotel. I'm very tentative about this and need to do a lot more research, but this is where the digging is leading me. And so on a deeper level, level two, I guess, again, this is all way premature, but the connection between America, Nazi Germany, Rome, and Jupiter worship ought to be examined. I cannot say anything more definitive at the moment. So we have um, all sorts of Jupiter clues sprinkled throughout Kubrick. So the Jupiter mission to the monolith in 2001, you know, it was originally supposed to go, in the book it goes to Saturn, but uh, Kubrick couldn't fake the rings, he says. So, Although they, there's a movie called Silent Running, and they go to, uh, they, and I believe it did come out in 72, had no problem with it then. So Jupiter, so we have the Jupiter and beyond the infinite sequence. Um, even Jupiter's moons are, in Ovid, like uh, uh, Io or Io, however you say it, Ganymede, Europa, Callisto. Um, we have the explosive bolts in 2001. That seems to be a nod to uh, Jupiter's bolts. Uh, again, all the eagles that are in The Shining, you know, and I think you can think of some other eagles, right? I, I found this very interesting. I, I found this late last night. So um, back in back on July fifth, twenty sixteen, Vivian Kubrick, who um, like I would call her the protege, uh, she sent out this tweet when the Juno probe, and Juno is the consort of Jupiter. She sent out this tweet on July 5th, 2016. Juno spacecraft officially orbiting Jupiter. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. I suddenly feel so emotional. The universe is opening up to us. Wondrous. She's very excited about the cohort of uh, the cohort probe reaching, uh, reaching Jupiter. I find that interesting. All right. The, I'll, do, I'll do the Minotaur here. And I guess I'm going to break this up into another piece. Because it's, it's just, it's going to get too long. So, so the Minotaur, a.k.a. Asterion, in uh, Book 8, 152-182, 
the son of, um, how do you say her name again? Pacifi. Pacifi. Wife of Minos and the white bull from the sea, a man-headed bull, imprisoned in the labyrinth, built by Daedalus at Knossos and destroyed by Theseus. So, um, Jack Torrance. Everybody agrees that Jack is the Minotaur, right? Frequently, Minotaurs are portrayed as wielding axes in popular culture, which makes Jack as the Minotaur more convincing. And we learned about the Minoan association with the double axe. By the way, I believe this axe is a Collins fire axe with an eagle beak. <laughs> so another eagle. Oh, Kubrick really wants to bring our attention to the eagle. And the and Jupiter is eagles. It, it, ju, the eagle is Jupiter's representative bird, his alchemical bird. And we've got birds all over the place. Roadrunners and loons, hawks. Um, and this is going to be really important in other places of Kubrick. Uh, the name Torrance sounds very similar to Taurus, which is obviously connected to the bull. And the Minotaur roughly translates, in my, it's my understanding, to King Minos's bull. So the first level, Jack is the Minotaur. Why is Jack the Minotaur? Is, is he a hybrid creature? Is he half man, half bull? Jack would seem to be the synthesis of man and demonic possession. So that would potentially explain the hybridization. But on a deeper level, if the shining and this allegory by extension are a critique of America, what is the hybrid analog? Who is the Minotaur? Who is Jack writ large? The only thing I, I, I could think of right away is the, is the white man's burden poem that Jack quotes. In Kipling's poem, the subjugation of the half devil, half child is justified. And I speculated there that Kubrick was offering a justification for his actions and that we are the hybrid. Is it possible we are the Minotaur? This conclusion troubles me because I also see us identify with Theseus in the allegory. So I'm undecided at the moment who the Minotaur correlates to at this level of interpretation. Some other, people have also said that um, the Minotaur myth is present in um, Lolita. Uh, Jared J. Abrams, who wrote The Philosophy of Stanley Kubrick, identifies Quilty with the Minotaur and Lolita with Ariadne and Humbert Humbert as uh, Theseus. Uh, that seemed like a very interesting theory to me. I think it's worth examining. Um, Hal, in 2001, looks there looks minotauri to me. There are reflections on the lens that appear to, that give him minotaur horns, but he's also cycloptic. So he's like this mishmash um, of of mythological figures, and I'm not prepared to diagnose that, but I wanted to bring that to your attention. And this might make Dave a Theseus character in addition, in addition with being Ulysses. I don't know. So if you check that out, if you want to see that most clearly, you want to check out the uh, nice, the scene where uh, uh, Hal says, that's a nice rendering. I mean, he doesn't say it like that. He goes, nice rendering. Um, I mentioned how uh, Killer's Kiss 1955 is, I mentioned this in the last uh, video, Kubrick put out on Minotaur Productions. And this film also features an ax prominently in the fight scene. So again, we have this artifact traveling through time and hinted at very early. I think this is going to be really important. I, we should not forget, I am seeing traces of this all over Kubrick. The Minotaur is also in Dante's Inferno. If you want, just think about one of the main characters from Dante's Inferno and see if you can pick up how Kubrick is, you know, pointing us to this. Um, I will, in the 237 movie, I thought there, had, there was a woman who was speaking, I forget her name, but she had some good points about the existence of the Minotaur, allusions to the Minotaur um, in, in The Shining. We have that skier 
who has like bull like uh, the there's a monarch skiing poster and it looks like the the legs are like hooves and the top part is a man and the bottom part because some depictions of uh, the Minotaur in mythology uh, don't necessarily have the uh, the bull on top with human legs. Uh, sometimes it's bull legs and the human top or some an inner mixture completely. Um, I thought that was interesting. And then opposite of it, when the Burns twins come through, there's a man riding the bull on the opposite side, sort of hinting at the connection between man and beast. And also she pointed out that there is an Indian, por uh, a portrait of an, uh, an American Indian wearing a headdress in the overlook. And sometimes I was looking, even Jack's hairline at times makes it look like he has horns, but that could be a coincidence. All right. So I'm going to end it there. We're 40 minutes in, and this is going to be a long burn. So I'm going to pick it up with uh, Kubrick as Daedalus on the next installment. <laughs>